Now it's my absolute pleasure to uh, introduce you to Dr. Elizabeth Volkman. Dr. Volkman, let's get you set up here and then I'd, I'd love to go through your full introduction. Let's make sure I can get your video on, sorry. Uh, Dr. Volkman is a board certified physician. Oh, sorry guys. Yeah. <laughs> That's not you. <laughs> Dr. Volkman is a board certified physician in internal medicine and rheumatology who specializes in the care of patients with systemic sclerosis and connective tissue disease related interstitial lung disease. She's an active clinical and transitional researcher. Her research focuses on understanding the cause of systemic sclerosis, identifying clinical and biological factors that predict outcomes in patients with systemic sclerosis, and helping to discover new therapies for systemic sclerosis and interstitial lung disease. She led the first study to investigate the gastrointestin gastrointestinal microbiome in systemic sclerosis and is now the principal investigator for an international microbiome consortium study for this condition. Dr. Volkman is the founder and co-director of the UCLA Connective Tissue Disease Related Interstitial Lung Disease Program. She strives to provide humanistic and compassionate care and seeks to empower her patients to improve their health through traditional as well as complementary and alternative treatment modalities. Welcome, Dr. Volkman. It's our, our uh, honor to have you here and I will pass the floor over to you. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much. Um, it's really an honor to be here and I wanna thank the Scleroderma Canada Foundation for inviting me um, to speak about a topic that I'm actually very passionate about. So I'm just pulling up my slides now. Um, and that is nutrition and systemic sclerosis. I feel like in, in this area, um, often other parts of the disease kind of overshadow the gastrointestinal tract and nutrition. And so I think it's really wonderful um, that your organization is uh, calling attention to this important part of the disease. Um, so the outline for the presentation today, I'm going to go through some general nutritional strategies that you can consider trying when you have systemic sclerosis. I'm then going to talk about the connection between your gut health and your intestinal microbiome. And as she mentioned, I do research in this area, and it's helping us kind of understand what are the causes of GI dysfunction in this condition. And then we'll go through some kind of practical tips, so strategies that you can employ to help improve your GI symptoms through making some modifications in your diet. And then we'll end with talking about um, some mindfulness approaches also that could be helpful for your nutrition. But when I think about nutritional strategies and systemic sclerosis, I think that what's out there now, if you, you know, do a Google search and you put in autoimmune disease and diets, you're gonna get a whole lot of recommendations. And I think this can be overwhelming, right? Because people may tell you, well, you have to do the paleo diet. And someone else may tell you, no, you need to be gluten-free. And then someone may say, why aren't you ketogenic? And here's a book that can cure your autoimmune disease. And you'll see all this advice out there. And then you may even see advice telling you, well, I tried the autoimmune protocol diet and it destroyed my health. And I think that this is what makes the field of nutrition so complicated is that there's a lot of advice out there and it can be confusing when you're first diagnosed with the disease to know what to do. And some of the limitations that I found with some of the, the programs online for autoimmune disease is that a lot of them advertise sort of a one size fits all approach and that regardless of whether you have scleroderma or lupus or autoimmune thyroiditis, there's, there's one way you should be eating. And, and really I think this is a one size fits all approach. Also, some of the diets out there claim to, you know, quote unquote, reduce inflammation, but you have to keep in mind that there really isn't evidence that these specific diets that make these claims, you know, measure the blood and measure inflammation levels. So again, I think this is more advertising than anything. And then a lot of these diets focus on what you need to eliminate, but they don't necessarily focus on what you need to actually consume more of or what you can do to target your symptoms. So the way I approach nutrition is a little bit differently, um, and I'm gonna walk you through sort of the introduction to the journey that I take with my patients in this area. And again, I would think of all of these as just suggestions. And if there's something I say today that resonates with you, you know, you're welcome to try it, talk about it with your doctor. If it doesn't resonate with you, you can just discard it. But um, I think this is a really important part of health, and, and hopefully in the future it's gonna be continuing to grow in terms of scleroderma research and development. 
So, uh, you know, there's a few guiding principles that I think are important to go over when we talk about nutrition, and that is there's really no one diet that works for everyone with scleroderma. And I work at one of the largest scleroderma centers in the United States. We see almost 3,000 patients a year with this disease. And I will tell you that there's, there's no one patient that's alike, and there's really no one diet that works for everyone. And that's because we're all so unique when it comes to our genetics. We're also unique in terms of where we live in the world and what season it is and whether it's very hot outside or very cold, this has an effect on what we should be eating. And in addition, we come from different cultures and there may be different traditions in our cultures of what we need to eat. So keeping this all in mind, I think it's important to understand that when you have systemic sclerosis, you're unique. And not only do you have a unique genetic background and unique disease features, but you may be on unique medications compared to another patient. You may be under unique circumstances with life stressors. Where you live, you may have access to some foods, but not others, depending on the season. So again, all these factors matter. So if you're you know, on a blog and you're reading about what another patient with scleroderma done has changed their diet, it may not necessarily apply to you if their situation is different. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. And then also, I think it's important to keep in mind that the relationship between how you feel and what you eat is kind of dynamic. So meaning that you may discover over time a diet that really works for you and helps you to feel well, but then your doctor all of a sudden gives you a medication to treat your disease or your arthritis, and this has an effect on your gut health, and you might have to modify your diet. Or you may develop you know, progression of GI disease from scleroderma itself, and that alone might help to make changes to your diet. So really, I think the best thing that you can do when you're starting this journey with scleroderma, really no matter where you are in your journey with scleroderma, is to try to really strengthen this connection between what you eat and how you feel. I guarantee you that if you develop more insight into this relationship, it's gonna help you down the line with managing the GI symptoms that sometimes come up in a very severe way later in the course of this disease. So even if you aren't affected by GI disease now, you still start trying to understand this relationship because it will serve you later on. So no matter where you are in your scleroderma journey, I think these um, pointers today might be helpful for you. And one way to start developing that insight is to keep a food diary. And some of you may have already done this um, for an extensive period of time, and that's it's wonderful. If you haven't done it before, what I would suggest is for a period of two to four weeks, I know it seems like a long time, but for a period of two to four weeks to really write down every day, every single thing that you're eating and drinking. And it may sound tedious, but writing things down is really the only way you're gonna be able to make connections between how you feel and what you're eating. Um, and I would write down not only how you feel, but maybe how you're functioning, what your sleep was like that day, your energy level, your mood, your pain, anything that you think might be relevant to your health. And I think writing it down is so important because it's really hard to even remember what we ate yesterday for dinner, <laughs> let alone over the course of the last couple of weeks. So the diary can be one way to start making connections between what you're eating and how it makes you feel. If you wanna go further with this process, you can do an elimination trial. And this is something that I would recommend only doing with um, the supervision of a healthcare provider to make sure that you're getting an adequate number of calories, vitamins, nutrients while you go through this. But the elimination trial can be helpful for really pinpointing foods that might be problematic for you. And again, what might be problematic for you may be different than someone else with scleroderma. So I would use the diary to kind of identify which ones you think may be problematic. So you might think, well, maybe it's dairy, but it could be gluten too. And then you can do an elimination where you eliminate both of those. And generally you would do it for a period of a month and then you would introduce it mindfully back into your diet one at a time. And what I mean by mindful reintroduction is this is really writing down every day what you're having. So not just dairy, but is it cow's milk? Is it yogurt? Is it butter? Really be specific and keep track of your symptoms because some patients don't need to eliminate 
all dairy, but they may have to eliminate, you know, milk and the things that have a higher lactose content. So I think that when you do introduce, the more mindfully you can do it, the better served your be, again, in terms of figuring out what foods feel right for you. And then the other thing that I think is critical is to, you know, focus on what you can eat as well, because again, a lot of the diets out there really focus on elimination and deprivation. And I believe, and what I've seen in my patients is that sometimes this can generate a lot of negative emotions. When someone becomes fixated on, oh, I can't have that, or they can't go out to eat with their friends or, you know, enjoy time with their family eating. They, they don't enjoy as much preparing the food because there's this constant focus on what I can't have. And that can be hard. So I would try to focus as much energy on what you can't have as what you can have and what nourishes you. And we'll go through some of those things today that might be helpful. Another thing that I think is important is to speak up in social situations where you know maybe you're uncomfortable out to eat, telling someone that you can't eat onions but really you have to speak up because this is your health and your life and you wanna make sure that you're surrounded by people that support you in this journey and doing what's right for you. And I think it's valuable to teach the people around you about your diet and how it helps you. And again, this can help empower you to really take control of your health. So now we'll segue into trying to understand the connection between gut health and the intestinal microbiome. And I know tomorrow you're going to have a talk by Dr. Janet Pope on GI disease and scleroderma, which I know will be excellent. She's an amazing physician. I just wanted to go through sort of an overview here in case some of you might not be able to make that talk. But really, GI involvement in scleroderma can start all the way at the esophagus and really move all the way down the GI tract till you get to the end of it. And so patients can have a lot of times dysphagia, reflux, they can have early satiety, like getting full too early, bloating, um, bleeding can happen in the GI tract. There can be malabsorption and weight loss, diarrhea, constipation, episodes of what we call pseudo obstruction, where there's like almost like a blockage in the gut, as well as fecal incontinence and rectal prolapse. And as you can imagine, these symptoms have a large effect on patients' quality of life, as many of you probably know firsthand. And when we think about what causes the GI problems in scleroderma, I think that this is one of the areas where there's a really unmet need in understanding exactly what causes it. But what we think is that there's probably some primary problems. So there's probably too much collagen, just like you have too much collagen in the skin, you can have too much collagen in the gut. And this can cause the muscle of the gut wall to break down, and then the gut will stop moving well. And when this happens, sort of secondary things come up. So there may be this obstruction that we talked about, blockages, and there could be an imbalance in the gut bacteria. But when I think about the relationship between these problems, I don't think about it just in one direction. I think it goes both ways, meaning that the bacterial imbalance that occurs, and we know that it can occur early in patients, can also be responsible for causing some of the dysmotility that we see. And this idea of imbalance is, is really quite interesting. So we think that you know, in your gut, you should have this healthy balance of this, this abundance of bacteria that we call commensal bacteria. They're healthy bacteria that we think protect against inflammation, protect against disease. And then you have bacteria that we call pathogenic or pathobionts. And these are bacteria that we think are more invasive and promote inflammation. And when we start to see this scale tip and we start to see more of these pathobionts, this is when disease can occur. So not just diseases like scleroderma, but other autoimmune diseases too, like inflammatory bowel disease, as well as metabolic diseases like obesity and diabetes. So this bacterial balance, I think, is really important to focus on. And we did, um, as she mentioned, one of the first studies, or the first study looking at the gut microbiome in patients with scleroderma at UCLA. And we had our patients undergo a colonoscopy, which was you know, not a great fun procedure, but they were doing a colonoscopy anyways, just for their screening colonoscopy. And we sampled from the cecum, which is the beginning part of the colon, and the sigmoid, which is towards the end of the colon. 
And we were interested in knowing whether the patients with scleroderma had a different composition of their bacteria than healthy people without scleroderma. And what we found was that there was a lot of differences in their gut bacteria. So I don't want you to focus too much on all these different confusing names, but what I do want to show you is that the ones that appear here in green, these were bacteria that were in greater abundance the patients with scleroderma, whereas the ones here that appear in red were in greater abundance in the healthy controls. And what you can see here is that the healthy controls had higher levels of things called Fisla bacterium, Clostridium, Ricinella. These are what we consider the healthy bacteria that we think protect against inflammation, and they were actually lower in the patients with scleroderma. Whereas things like Fusobacterium, Streptococcus, we think of these as being pathobiont bacteria that might promote inflammation. And then somewhat interestingly is that lactobacillus, which is commonly in probiotics, some of you maybe take probiotics and we'll talk about that later in the talk, this was actually higher in the patients with scleroderma very interestingly. And so we also have determined that dysbiosis is associated with symptoms. So in, in this study and in subsequent studies that we've done, we found that, for example, higher levels of fusobacterium is associated with more GI symptoms, whereas something like Bacteroides fragilis is associated with less GI symptoms. So not only are there imbalances in the gut bacteria in patients with scleroderma, but these imbalances relate to a patient's experience of the disease and particularly how they experience their GI symptoms. So what are some strategies to help improve this dysbiosis? And I'll go through a few, but I think one of the key ones and something that's probably healthy for everyone to do, whether or not you have scleroderma or not, is to avoid having ultra processed foods. So these are foods where chemicals or additives are added in and generally it's done to preserve the shelf life of the food or change the color or the taste. Um, and these are things like hot dogs, bacon, potato chips, a lot of frozen meals. And I'm gonna go through why this can be dangerous for your gut bacteria. But if you're curious at home, you know, you can after this talk, go through your cupboards and just take a look. If you have food in boxes, or packages, look at the ingredient list. And if there's more than about five ingredients, definitely more than 10, then it's likely that food has been processed a lot. And especially if you notice ingredients and their chemical names that you can't even pronounce, that's a really good sign that the food has been processed. You know, and why is this important? Well, a number of studies have shown that the food additives can have an effect on your gut bacteria in that healthy balance we're trying to achieve. So here was a nice review article that went through a number of studies looking at the relationship between food additives, your intestinal microbiome, and how this affects the body. And so some of these you may have never heard of. I hadn't heard of all of them. But things like aspartame, are, you know, a lot of people know about. And all of these had an effect in causing dysbiosis, so imbalances. Um, bacterial overgrowth. And then the ultimate effect on either the human or the animal they were studying was more GI inflammation, metabolic syndrome, glucose intolerance. So clearly these things have a significant effect. So if, if you're going to do one change to your diet that might help improve the balance of your gut bacteria, eliminating these ultra processed foods is probably a good idea. Some other strategies, and we'll go through each of these one by one, is to consider avoiding or limiting a lot of raw food in your diet, avoiding added sugars, and avoiding and limiting red meat. So when it comes to raw food, and this is a tricky area, but if you have a gut that moves more slowly, meaning you have problems with constipation, distension after you eat, consuming raw fruits and vegetables might be challenging for you especially those foods that are high in what we call FODMAP. So the vegetables listed here and the fruits listed here can sometimes be challenging for patients to consume if they're raw. Now, if they're cooked, sometimes they're easier to tolerate, but these, when consumed raw, can be problematic for people with a slow moving gut. So what are FODMAPs? Because I think a lot of people have heard of the low FODMAP diet if they have scleroderma, but basically, FODMAPs are a type of carbohydrate that moves through your intestine and it can't be digested. 
So for a lot of people who don't have scleroderma, FODMAPs are actually very healthy foods because it's a source of fiber. It's also a prebiotic, meaning that it helps to feed the good bacteria in your gut. So these aren't bad foods. It's just that if you can't tolerate them raw, you may have to consider cooking them a different way to try to better tolerate them. But if you can tolerate them, then you definitely want to keep consuming them. And what I've seen sometimes in my clinical practice is patients coming to me who have been put on a low FODMAP diet from another provider, and then they've just stayed on it for years. And the purpose of the low FODMAP diet was never meant to be a long-term solution. It was really to eliminate foods that can be problematic, and then the idea is to slowly introduce foods one at a time, right? Because obviously things like broccoli and artichoke can have a lot of other healthful properties. Um, if you stay on the low FODMAP diet long-term, you may become deficient in certain vitamins and nutrients. So I think it's important to just keep in mind if someone puts you on the low FODMAP diet to just remember that you wanna to try to reincorporate some of these foods. Obviously, you know, the sugar-free candy, you don't have to, but some of these really healthy vegetables if you can try to reincorporate them one at a time, um, I think this will be beneficial for your health. And when you know talking about raw food, sometimes people can tolerate raw food just fine, but the issue is how they combine them with other foods. So let's say you have a, a heavy pasta meal with meat. Um, this kind of food with a high fat and high protein content causes the gut to slow down because it has to work harder to digest these types of foods. And then in this meal, you have a nice bowl of berries, which is very healthy to do. But what can happen is you can get a lot of abdominal pain. And this is again because the gut slows down to digest the heavy protein and fat that's in your meal. But the berries really should be digested very quickly in the GI tract. And so if they're around too long and don't move as quickly as they should, they will start to ferment and this can cause gas and bloating. So I think if you can tolerate berries and other fruits, I would make sure you have them on their own and not in combination with a heavier meal. What about added sugar? So this is another very interesting area of research where studies have shown that if you have high glucose, high fructose foods, so these are things like packaged cookies, sodas, this can decrease your gut bacteria diversity, meaning that it can lower the just overall number of different species that you have in your gut. And we think that the healthiest gut has a kind of large variety of biodiversity of bacteria. This can also, in some studies, increase gut permeability. And some of you may have heard of this concept of the leaky gut syndrome, and, and this is kind of a layman's term, but it really is a, a true phenomenon where you have proteins that kind of work together as blocks um, and they keep that intestinal barrier intact. And then having this kind of diet with high sugar can sometimes increase the leakage and the gut permeability so that inflammation that's in the gut can then get out into the bloodstream. So it really is a true thing and it's been linked to having a high sugar diet. What about red meat? So at least in the United States, and I'm not exactly sure how it is in Canada, but in the US, there's a lot of red meat um, where animals are exposed to a lot of hormones um, and the consumption of this can affect your immune system and the bacterial balance. There have been studies showing that increased consumption of red meat is associated with an increased risk of certain autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis and multiple sclerosis. I would also caution you that swallowing can sometimes be challenging when you have scleroderma and red meat can sometimes provoke cho choking in these situations. And just in terms of nutritional benefit, there's just a whole lot of other ways to get the protein that you may get from red meat um, without these uh, kind of side effects. And this was an interesting study that I wanted to tell you about because it was a really large study from the United States looking at thousands and thousands of patients. And they followed these patients long term and what they found was that an increase in total red meat consumption of at least a half serving a day was associated with a 10% higher mortality risk. And then when they broke it down into whether someone was having the processed or unprocessed meats, so the processed meats would be things like the bacon, the hot dogs, salami, 
the processed meat had an even higher mortality risk. So again, I think that if you're thinking about, you know, eliminating red meat from your diet, I think that there's a lot of evidence that that might be a good approach to take. Again, talking with your doctor and making sure that you're getting your protein and other vitamins through other sources. And then prebiotics can be helpful. And I, I mentioned this briefly when we were talking about the FODMAPs, but prebiotics are basically fibers that the good bacteria kind of feed off of them and they help them grow. And so here are some good sources here of prebiotics. And again, you might not all be able to tolerate onion or garlic, but you know, if you can tolerate some asparagus or jicama or chicory root, these are some ways where you can get prebiotics to help improve that balance. And then when it comes to probiotics, I think that, you know, we still don't know exactly what is the right probiotic for scleroderma. There's been two studies uh, recently published in the last year looking at um, small groups of patients where half the group was assigned to take a probiotic and the other half was assigned to take placebo and neither knew which group they were in. And at the end of a two month period, there was actually no difference in the GI symptoms between the patients taking the probiotic and those not. And so it, this may be because we don't really have the right probiotic yet for scleroderma. I mentioned to you that in our study, we found that patients with scleroderma had higher abundance of lactobacillus. And this is actually what's in a lot of probiotics already. So we may need to do more research to figure out what is the right probiotic for scleroderma. But at this point in time, the, the commercially available probiotics uh, may not help this condition. So now let's go through some specific symptoms of scleroderma that might be helpful to you. And I think when I manage GI symptoms with patients with scleroderma in my practice, we don't just focus on what the patient is eating, but we also focus on their lifestyle and sort of the conditions around their eating. So stress management and mindfulness, all of this matters because you could have the most healthy, clean diet ever, but if you're under tremendous stress and you're eating while you're driving and you know life is just chaotic, it may not even matter what you eat. So I think it's important to take this multi-dimensional approach. So we'll talk about acid reflux because I think this is one area where a lot of patients are already experts in. They know what foods trigger their symptoms because they get the symptoms right away. So when they eat fried food, poor quality vegetable oils, red meat, coffee, um, hot spices, alcohol, citrus fruits, and vinegar, these are things that can provoke acid reflux and should be avoided. But there's also foods that actually, if you increase your consumption of, can actually help you. And these would be things like soups, especially vegetable soups, um, gluten-free oats, yogurts can be helpful. And you know, you don't, if you can't tolerate dairy, there's a lot of non-dairy yogurts out there now that are made from nut products or oat milk. Um, avocado, if you can tolerate this, can be helpful. Spinach, cucumber, liquid chlorophyll can also be useful. And then um, chamomile tea can be helpful as well. When it comes to bloating, I think it's really important to make sure that you're drinking enough water during the day, first and foremost. It's really common when people get dehydrated to become more constipated and this in turn causes bloating. If you're having severe bloating, it's helpful to avoid white foods and things are white bread, white rice, white sugar. And then try to avoid these combinations that we talked about earlier where you're combining that heavy protein, heavy fat with a simple carb like a fruit or sugar, these can also promote more bloating. And then the issue of fiber I think is important because for the average person who has constipation, who doesn't have scleroderma, sometimes all they have to do is just up their fiber intake and they start having more normal bowel movements. But if you overdo it on the fiber and you have scleroderma, this can actually work against you and cause more bloating. So I think it's important to be careful with fiber supplements because um, you don't want to take too much and have it kind of um, cause the opposite effect of what you're looking for. And so I think it's helpful sometimes to do natural fiber um, supplements like ground flaxseed where you can actually titrate the amount that you're getting um, when you're consuming this versus just taking a fiber pill. 
Other bloating recommendations is that, you know, if you're in one of these big flare-ups um, and you're very distended, obviously you're going to be seeing your doctor and you could also consider making one of your meals a day a liquid meal. So a vegetable soup, pureed vegetables, if you can tolerate a green smoothie. Again, you want to make sure you're still getting the same number of calories that you would get from another meal, but really this could help just give your gut a break right, and help with the digestive process because if you're blended or cooked in a soup, your body doesn't have to work as hard to digest it as it would if you were having these raw. I also think it's important to make sure that you're warm before you eat. If you're cold, you know, your, your circulation is gonna be going to certain organs, your heart, your lungs. The GI tract is not as essential as those organs, so you wanna make sure that you're nice and warm when you eat. And then I also think if you have bloating, it's nice to take a walk after you eat. You know, you definitely want to stay upright, but walking can sometimes stimulate a little bit of gut motility. It doesn't have to be a vigorous walk and doesn't even have to be a long walk, but 10 to 20 minutes, kind of a gentle walk can kind of get things moving along after you eat. And then there are some herbal remedies. And again, with all herbs and supplements, you want to talk to your doctor before starting these. But I think things like chamomile tea and lemon balm tea can be helpful for a lot of patients. Um, similarly, aloe vera juice is something that um, a lot of my patients will take in the morning and this helps to stimulate a bowel movement. You just have to be careful if you have too much aloe vera juice that can cause some diarrhea. But aloe vera juice is generally something that's safe for most patients to take. And then finally, I wanted to address weight loss because this is something that can happen over the course of scleroderma and can be very troubling for patients where they feel like, you know, I'm eating the same amount as I've always eaten, but I can't keep weight on and the weight is coming off. And so when I think about weight loss, I think it's good to think about what is the cause. And it's, it's quite simple is you start to lose weight when you're expending more calories than you're taking in. And, you know, in scleroderma, there's a lot of causes of having to need more caloric intake because you have increased energy output. So, for example, if you have lung disease and it's more difficult for you to breathe, it's going to take more energy for you to do activities than it would if you didn't have the lung disease. Similarly, if you have some physical challenges like arthritis or muscle inflammation, joint contractions or skin disease, the body takes more energy to move more efficiently. Even the inflammation that's just related to scleroderma can cause you to have to require to take in more energy. And you can think about this like if you've ever had the flu. A lot of times when people get the flu, the body produces all this inflammation and they can lose five to 10 pounds in a couple of weeks. And again, this is because the body's working extra hard and this same kind of inflammation is going on in the background of a patient with scleroderma all the time. And then finally, you know, having a chronic disease like this, and you would know better than anyone, can cause a lot of stress. And this stress alone can cause worrying thoughts and that can take energy too. So when you think about weight loss, I think it's important to address the things that maybe are causing you to need to take in more calories. But similarly, there can be causes of decreased energy intake. So if you have malabsorption, meaning that you're eating, but your gut isn't absorbing all the calories, vitamin, and nutrients that it needs from foods, this has to be addressed. Similarly, if you have decreased appetite, this also needs to be addressed because there's a lot of causes of decreased appetite when you have scleroderma. Sometimes it's just related to having the disease. Um, other times it could be related to a medication side effect. Um, if you have depression, loss of appetite is a common symptom of depression. Um, and if you have difficulty swallowing, you may not even feel like eating. And so I think that addressing the causes of decreased appetite can also be important in terms of thinking about how to increase energy intake. So what should you do? I think that addressing the causes of increased energy expenditure are really important. So the treatment for the lung disease, your arthritis, myopathy, skin disease, physical therapy can be helpful to help you to improve your mobility and how you get around, treatment to reduce inflammation, and then interventions that could possibly help reduce the negative effects of stress. 
And then, you know, if you have issues with malabsorption, you need to be working with a doctor who specializes in that. And it may be your scleroderma doctor, it could be a gastroenterologist, a nutritionist. It's you know, usually good to work with all three. Try to have foods that are easier to digest. Again, raw foods, it takes the body more energy to digest. So you might be better off eating more cooked foods, small frequent meals, and then really trying to increase your healthy fat intake because fats are something that um, have a high calorie source, but don't take up too much space in your gut. And so I work with patients on kind of creatively sneaking in some of these healthy fats. Um, so let's say you're having your morning oats, you could put in some flaxseed oil or some olive oil, and then you're boosting the number of calories with just adding a very small volume to what you're eating, and that can be helpful. Keep in mind too that the dark green vegetables, if you can tolerate these, can also be sources of healthy fats too. And then I think, you know, one thing that doesn't always get addressed with doctors, because um, I think that, you know, there's a lot to think about with scleroderma, but you can get vitamin deficiencies in this disease. And some people just will take a vitamin supplement, but I think it's actually better to have your vitamin levels tested so that you really take what you need to take. And you want to make sure you're not taking too much of something because that can have risk too. So I would just talk with your doctor and try to see if they can test you for vitamin deficiencies and then help guide you in terms of what you should take to help replete those vitamins. Because again, the vitamin industry and the commercial vitamin industry is, is not regulated. So I think this is best done with the guidance of a healthcare provider. And the, the last part of this talk is something about, is really about mindfulness and how I have found this to be helpful in reducing symptoms in patients with scleroderma. And there is this whole idea of a brain gut connection. It's really true when people say, I feel it in my gut. It's, it's true because there's an entire nervous system in your gut, right? The same type of neurons and glial cells that you have in your brain they exist in your gut too. And this is really important to consider because when you eat, you wanna make sure that this nervous system is in a calm state. We call this the parasympathetic state. And this is the state where you digest things better. So some of the things that I suggest for patients are to try to create a calm space for your eating. And maybe you can even have a pre-meal ritual. So I recommend if you're coming home from work or even if your work is at home now on Zoom, that you change out of your clothes into something more comfortable when you're gonna eat. You don't wanna be eating with a tight fitting dress or skirt that's gonna constrict you in any way, especially if you have bloating. You wanna be comfortable. Sometimes it's nice to take a warm shower before you eat, do something to kind of get your mind relaxed and let go of the stress of the day. Um, I also think it's critical to where you're eating, you kind of clear the space of potential triggers for stress. So, you know, it's not good to eat and look at a stack of bills you have there, or, you know, I commonly have my computer open and I'm doing work and it's, it's terrible. <laughs> so try to make that space clear so that you can just focus on your eating and not be worried about anything else at that time. And then while you are eating, it's helpful to be seated upright, right? This will help in terms of your esophageal function and make sure you have good posture. You don't wanna eat in a reclined position because this can really exacerbate reflux symptoms. You can do some things like mindfully breathing before you eat to get your body into a relaxed place or even think about chewing mindfully. And this would be you know, your first few bites of your food, paying attention to the texture of the food in your mouth, what it smells like, what it tastes like, Again, to just try to find a way to be more present in this activity. And this is another time where you could even consider practicing, you know, having some gratitude for the food that's in front of you and um, the fact that you, you have food to eat. And then finally, we talked a little bit about this throughout the talk, but I just want to emphasize that in terms of after you eat, this is a time where you can have some warm herbal tea like the chamomile or a lemon balm take a digestive walk. Again, this can just be a gentle walk for 10 to 15 minutes. Try to stay upright for at least two to three hours so you don't wanna eat and go straight to bed. And then this last point here is something that a lot of people don't consider, but um, I learned this when I was studying Chinese medicine is that 
if you take a warm bath or shower immediately after eating, the blood is going to flow to all different different parts of the body, right? And you get warm, but the problem is it diverts the blood flow from the gut. And after you eat, you really want the blood flow going to the gut. So if you're gonna take a warm shower, try to take it before you eat and not immediately afterwards, or at least wait a couple of hours before doing it. So to summarize, I think that how you eat can have a huge effect on how you feel when you have systemic sclerosis. And I believe, and this is through treating thousands of patients with this disease, that an individualized approach to nutrition is likely to lead to better long-term outcomes. And the only way to do this is to develop a relationship with your body to help you understand what foods make you feel good and what foods don't. And you're the only one that knows that, right? No doctor, no nutritionist, no guru can tell you this. You're the only one that can figure out what foods are right for you. And one way to do this again is to start out by keeping a food diary and trying to eat when you feel relaxed, when you can eat more mindfully and be aware of how foods are making you feel. And then if you are gonna make some changes, I think universally avoiding processed foods, added sugar and red meat are things that, again, even patients without scleroderma could be beneficial to their health. Um, limiting raw vegetables, again, can be helpful if you have bloating. Um, and if you're considering doing a plant-based diet, I have found this to be helpful in a lot of my patients with scleroderma. So I wanted to make sure we had a little bit of time for questions. I think we went a little bit over, but I wanted to thank Scleroderma Canada again for inviting me here. Um, and then these are some of the organizations who funded the research that I do in this area, and I'm very grateful to them. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wolfman. I'm going to take over sharing my screen. Um, what an what a informative session. We appreciate that so much. So we do have a couple of questions. Um, okay. Actually, I'll, before I take over the screen, I'll, I'll, leave, these, or I'll leave yours up. Um, so Jillian says, I make my own kefir and consume half cup a day. I find it has helped my reflux to the point that I'm no, or sorry, that I'm on half the medication I take for my reflux. So not so much of a question, I think it's just- uh, Yeah, sharing. no, I think that's great. Kefir is um, another source of probiotics. And what's nice about kefir, again, it's, it's a cultured food and it's kind of a more natural way of getting a probiotic. And it will have a more variety of those bacteria than just if you take a pill that has lactobacillus or bifidobacterium. So um, I think if you can tolerate kefir, then it's a wonderful thing to add into the diet, both for the upper GI tract and lower GI tract health. Wonderful. Uh, Lisa, Lisa, excuse me, says, because of my drive from Shogun's, my ophthalmologist is suggesting migraines. Suggest, uh, the migraine specialist wants me to take very high levels of riboflavin to help with the photosensitivity. However, I know B vitamins are water soluble and my body only keeps what it needs. What do you think? No, it's very true. And I think that this is a situation where it's helpful to have the B vitamins measured first before you start any supplement. Um, you know, a lot of times people take a B complex vitamin that will have that in it. And then they're having a cereal that's fortified and then their orange juice has it too. And then before you know it, the B vitamins are very elevated. And we know from, from studies and from clinical experience that high levels, for example, of B12 can damage nerves. And so I think that if you're going to take this approach, it's first of all important to have a doctor measure those B vitamin levels and then tell you exactly what you need to take. Next question comes from Patricia and she asks, do you recommend kombucha for scleroderma patients? So kombucha, for those people that haven't heard about it, um, is another type of uh, fermented beverage, basically. Um, so it's another source of potential probiotics. And I would say that this is something that helps some patients, but not others. And sometimes people can only tolerate a small amount. And the reason being is that because it's fermented, it's almost like drinking a carbonated beverage. And if you have issues with distension and bloating, sometimes it can make it worse. So I would recommend, you know, if you want to try it, to try a small amount first and see how you like it. And again, tune into your body because that'll be the best judge. So I don't think it helps everyone with scleroderma, but for some patients it can. Thank you. Uh, what about, do you take clients virtually? Kara asks. Oh yeah, 
Um, we do actually. Um, one of the silver linings of the pandemic is that it forced us to learn how to do virtual visits. Um, so we're doing this now and I do see um, even new patients virtually um, from anywhere. So um, if you go on the UCLA website and search my name, they'll have the number for calling to schedule appointments. Um, and we use a similar platform to Zoom. It works, it works pretty well. <laughs> Wonderful. And you said that was on the UCLA site? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any remedies to alleviate episodes of diarrhea? Yeah, diarrhea is a, a tricky one because, you know, most patients with scleroderma have more problems with constipation, bloating, than diarrhea. So when treating the diarrhea, we really have to figure out what is the cause. Is it because the gut is moving too quickly and we need to give a patient something to slow down the gut? Or sometimes the diarrhea is actually a result of things moving too slowly, getting backed up to the point where then all of a sudden the patient just can't hold it any longer. And so in these situations, I think it's really helpful to see a gastroenterologist and undergo what we call motility testing to see how the gut is moving. And once we figure out, is this the gut moving too fast or too slow, then we try to do things to manipulate that. And I would say that now we have um, some good treatments for speeding up the gut motility. And one of them is called procalipride. And you may hear about this in your other talks. And this was something that was recently FDA approved um, in the US for the treatment of cons chronic constipation. But before this, I was actually having my patients order it from Canada because it was approved there <laughs> first. Um, but this seems to work very well in, in promoting motility, not just uh, in the lower gut, but also in the esophagus too. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I will take, I'm gonna take one more question. So are you comfortable sharing your slides first of all? Because yeah. if so, the next okay, question sure. is from Evelyn and I'm happy, if you'll send them to me, I'm happy to make them a part of our resource center that we're going to work on putting together. Yeah, absolutely. That's great, thank you. Um, and then I think maybe just one more question. And then if there's questions that we that go unanswered, I will maybe send them to you. And if you can send them to me, I can circulate them to who's asked. Um, so which micronutrients do you find can be low in scleroderma patients? That's a great question. I'm working right now with um, a medical student. We're doing a huge review of every study published in scleroderma um, looking at micronutrients. And so this will be published probably in the spring, but I will give you a preview that we're seeing that across the board, vitamin D tends to be very low in patients with scleroderma um, in every study that's ever been reported on it. Um, the B vitamins are common. We've seen um, zinc be lower in patients, and I would say that sometimes vitamin C. So that study will come out again in the springtime, but I would say across the boards, most studies show this low vitamin D, regardless of where you live in the world and how much sunlight you have. Thank you. All right, I think it's important that we uh, try to stick to our timeline and I wanna be respectful of your time as well. So we'll wrap things up there. Again, any questions that we may have missed, I will um, forward to you if that's all right. And then I can send answers out uh, as you get them to me. So thank you so much for your time and thank you thank for being you. such it a privilege great. to have you here. And uh, we'll talk soon. Okay. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.